So I'm gonna give a talk today on a new field that I'm calling sequential decision analytics, a unified framework. These are the problems of everyday life, freight transportation, manufacturing, logistics, supply chains, uh, health, energy, e-commerce, finance. These are all the problems that we encounter in everyday life of humans making decisions and pretty much covers every activity that involves humans because we all make decisions and we're endlessly dealing with uncertainty. Um, each of these systems can be thought as a flow of information with humans making decisions along the process. Um, and if we, uh, a good way to think about these problems is as a manufacturing line with robots uh, adding parts to a car, making the chassis better and better and closer to a car. If we wanna do a better job with these processes, we're gonna to need to focus on the various metrics, uh, reducing costs, increasing profits, uh, reducing risk, reduce carbon uh, production, uh, minimize waste, whatever the goals and objectives are. Now, if I wanna do better, if I wanna achieve better goals, I have to make better decisions. And one of the odd things, in, in, at least in more complex problems, is that um, you have to think about what decisions you're making. Now, sometimes these are obvious, like in finance, we're buying and selling assets, but if you want to uh, improve health or respond to the COVID epidemic, or maybe just make your supply chain more productive, you have to figure out what decisions you're making. And then the second step is how do you make effective decisions? Now, somewhere in that conversation, somebody's going to say, seems like we need to turn to artificial intelligence. So I want to pause for a little bit because uh, there's a lot of confusion about artificial intelligence. Uh, if you go to somebody in computer science who works in AI and say, what is artificial intelligence? The first definition you'll, you'll usually run into is making computers behave like humans because humans are the, the pinnacle of intelligence. But recently we started to say, no, we, we'd like to make computers smarter than humans. If you go back to the 60s and 70s, we had rule-based AI, if reading uh, uh, meat, then drink red wine. But when we got to more complex settings like health and saying, okay, we have all these attributes of a patient, what's the right treatment? Things got complicated. In the 1990s, uh, we went through the wave of optimization. Uh, people in operations research are familiar that we've been working on optimization since the 1950s, but it hit this big wave in, in the public's imagination. We were solving big problems. But once again, people started to apply it to complex problems like a supply chain, and suddenly that stopped working. Now, in the early 2000s, machine learning became the new AI, and especially this was neural networks where people could uh, do uh, uh, amazing things like recognize your voice. Now, starting a few years ago, reinforcement learning, which has been in the research community for a while, uh, started to hit the press, and people, as, as uh, we had some really major breakthroughs in playing chess and Go, um, and, and this is starting to capture, again, the public's imagination. So what's opening for the, for the 2020s? Where are we headed? And I'm going to say what's next in AI is sequential decision problems, where we need to make decisions over time as new information arrives. And in this talk, I'm going to propose to unify 15 distinct fields that deal with the dynamic decision making and put it into a new field that I call sequential decision analytics. Now, in this talk, I want to open up with uh, what I'll call the five layers of intelligence, but look at the bottom bullet. This is where I'm going to end with a proposal for a new educational field. So let's start with the five layers of intelligence. Now, the top layer is decisions. That's what I want to get to. But you have to understand that to make good decisions on a computer, you have to understand all five layers. Let's start at the bottom, information acquisition and storage. So we start with basic things like keyboard entry, barcodes, RFID chips, GPS trackers, image sensing, and speech recognition. These then have to go into the computer and be stored in this nice array of, of, of improving uh, data storage technologies. Today, most of it all seems to end up on the cloud. And you can't ignore the powerful software that allows us to access this data. It's not enough just to store it. You have to be able to, to get to it. But even when you store it, uh, now we have to start talking about sharing and, and, and coordinating. So the next step in that is communication. Now, communication goes back thousands of years, I guess, but I'm gonna start with the lowly payphone, uh, spread through the invention of the internet, uh, satellite communication, uh, cell towers has been an amazing breakthrough. Uh, pretty soon, uh, uh, SpaceX is going to give us their Starlink network, so we'll have Wi-Fi everywhere. And we really cannot ignore this amazing device called uh, the smartphone that allows us to get information to individual humans wherever they are. 
Now, if you're a company, uh, there's still this issue, the data is there, it's stored, but you don't know, you still don't know where your products are. So a number of companies have emerged called visibility platforms and Project 44 and Four Kites are two of the most visible there where a company can say, where is my product? And, and they'll come back and say, it's on this ship, it's on this train, uh, it's sitting in this port. And somewhere in there, when you put it on the computer, you'll have to talk about security and blockchain. Uh, I, that's all I will say other than to acknowledge it's very important. Now we get to the level of transactions and execution. So this is the point where we actually start running a company. Uh, uh, ERP systems and transportation management systems. This is where we're doing accounting and billing and order tracking and inventory management and driver tracking. This is where we're starting to run our company and computers are doing this very executional transactional uh, 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 type of calculations, very important, but these systems are are uh, all have to be supported by humans in the background actually making the real decisions. Now, the next step up there is learning. Okay, so this is what's been getting a lot of attention uh, these days. Uh, I like to describe machine learning as where we take information that we do know to estimate something that we do not know. How will the market respond to price? How long will it take for the order to arrive from China? How much energy will the wind farms generate this afternoon? Now, I like to talk about four types of learning, pattern matching, is that a flower? If it is, what type of flower? Or here's somebody just logged into the internet, maybe he wants to buy a pair of sunglasses. How will increase in price affect a market demand or what's the condition of a piece of equipment? And good old fashioned prediction, here's the history of what's gonna happen in the future. Now, whenever we're doing machine learning, we're doing so with certain technologies that fall into three broad and overlapping buckets, lookup table, parametric models, non-parametric models. Now, somebody may be saying, well, wait a minute, where's neural networks? I mean, that's what's getting all the attention. Now, there they are. They're sort of nestled in between parametric and non-parametric. Generally, as a general rule, uh, the smaller, they call shallow neural networks are parametric models, but the deep neural networks that we hear a lot about are technically non-parametric models. But whatever it is at the end of the day, we're working with these three circles. Now, neural networks have really proven themselves in, in, in pattern recognition, facial recognition, voice recognition, handwriting recognition. Uh, one thing that you uh, need to realize is these are all deterministic problems and they take a lot of data. You need a data set where somebody like a radiologist that said, here's all these x-ray images, which ones have cancer? And a human has to say, here are the ones with cancer. Um, it's very powerful, it's been very effective, but neural networks have difficulty capturing problem structure and handling noise. Here's a problem, uh, a classical thing called a news vendor problem, uh, where uh, what we're doing is we're gonna order a quantity of say product, and then we make a certain amount of profit. If I order a certain quantity, I get an observed profit and it's noisy, it can be high, it can be low, depending on what the market demand is. Um, now, this is where I have fitted a neural network to this data, and you can see it's, it's not a very good fit. The red line, that's the true function. And we happen to know that the more order, uh, the more product that you put out, the higher the profit up to a point, and then it starts going down. And we know about that structure, but it's not that easy to tell a neural network. So we have to watch out for some of the limitations of neural networks. So now we get to the top layer, decisions. Now, let's go back to our broad ranging set of problems, behind all of these problems are humans making decisions, all kinds of decisions. Okay, so we're not gonna read all of these, but every one of these things is something where a human has to make a choice of what to do. Now, sometimes we have machines doing it, but most of these are, are human driven. Now, there are three broad categories of decisions, decisions that impact uh, physical resources, inventories or moving a truck around or scheduling nurses and energy generators. We have financial decisions of managing financial assets. And we have informational decisions of sending and receiving information, marketing and advertising, testing drugs as a form of information decision. Now, there's also three different time frames, and these are important. We have strategic planning decisions. How many nurses should I have? How many pilots? Which suppliers should make a part? Where should I put my facilities? Tactical planning decisions, a lot of people use this word in different ways. I use it as I'm making a decision now that will impact my system in the future. Should a trucking company accept a load to be moved a week from now? Should I place an order that will arrive from China in three months? What pricing and marketing strategies should I use next quarter given that sales are down this quarter? 
And then you have the real-time execution decisions of which driver to assign to a load now or what bid to, uh, uh, what to bid on an ad click to maximize ad clicks or what drug to give to a, a, a patient to treat their, their condition. Now, one way to think of these things is strategic planning decisions is where we simulate decisions in the future that do not depend on the state of the system now. Tactical planning is simulating decisions in the future that do depend on the state of the system now. And real-time execution decisions are decisions that are implemented now, but then we may have to simulate decisions in the future to understand the downstream impact. Now, don't forget about all the different levels in which decisions to be made. We've got the C-suite decisions, typically strategic. We have the middle management decisions. Maybe they're the ones planning inventory or staffing or setting performance metrics. And then we have field operations, such as day-to-day -day execution decisions, assigning jobs to people, dispatching of trucks. Now, let's take this uh, classic optimization problem of airline scheduling. Uh, I don't know how many people listening to this talk understand that math in the middle, but there's a lot of people who do. There's people who are trained in this particular mathematics called linear programming and integer programming. They can go to a problem like an airline. They know how to translate the problem into this math and out comes an airline schedule. And this is exceptionally powerful. This became very popular in the 1990s. And, and there's uh, schools all around the country that produce these people. There's standard software packages. You can have low dimensional decisions like planning a path from A to B. You can have higher dimensional decisions like where should I locate uh, a facility? Now I'm interested in sequential decisions where you make a decision and then new information comes in. And then you make another decision and then more information comes in. And it's decisions and information, decisions, information. And the information that arrives after a decision uh, is made is unknown when the decision is made, which means it's uncertain. Now here's examples, inventory uh, planning. I, I place an order that might arrive in the future. Then I observe the customer demand. Then I place another inventory ordering decision and then I observe customer demand and so on and so forth. I can be a, a truck dispatcher assigning drivers to loads and over time I'm making assignment decisions and then observing customer demands. Uh, health, when I'm testing new vaccines, I, I try out a dosage and then I observe the patient outcome and I have to choose people, I have to choose the dosage, I have to choose the timing uh, or finance. Maybe this is happening at a sub-second level with high frequency trading where I'm assigning uh, 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 trading among assets and then observing changes in prices. Now, behind all these decisions, so we, we saw this, this rich array of decisions before, uh, is information. And this is information arrived after I made the decision that would have been useful to the decision. If I had known this information, maybe I could have made a better decision, which means all of those decisions would be made under uncertainty. Now, when you're making decisions for uncertainty, problems become dramatically more complicated. This is what you know now, and I can buy a, a sell or hold an asset. Maybe the price goes up, down, or stays the same, and so on and so forth. And you get this explosion, and this is a trivial problem. Imagine a much more complex problem. So let's talk about modeling sequential decision problems. Now, if you want to take a real world problem and let the computer help you out, in between, you're going to have to model it mathematically. Now, if you have a deterministic optimization problem or a machine learning problem, everybody trained in those fields knows how to write down their problem mathematically. In the world of sequential decision problems, we lack a standard framework. There, there isn't a single way that everybody knows to write out their problem. I like to call this the jungle of stochastic optimization. Every one of these terms refers to a field that works in the uh, area of sequential decisions. Each one is supported by at least one book, maybe a series of books, but these are not uh, different books in the same field. Every one is a different field. They have their own notational systems. They have their own tools, their own application areas. Um, this is the right way to model a sequential decision problem. You have a state, which is what you know. This is, this is what you know or believe. Then you make a decision. And then the new information comes in that leads you to a new state. Every time you make a decision, you receive a contribution. Decisions are made with a method that we're going to call a policy. And the goal is to find the policy that maximizes its expected contributions. Now, I'm going to now model these in a, in a, in a very clean way. I have five dimensions, state variables, which can be physical states, other information like prices and weather, or belief state, in case that you don't know something perfectly. 
you have decision variables that are made with a policy. You have exogenous information that comes to you from outside that I didn't know when I made the decision. I have a transition function that tells me how the state variable evolves over time. And finally, I have the objective function where I'm optimizing over policies. These five elements describe any sequential decision problem. In other words, I can model every one of those problems in, in the jungle uh, using this modeling framework. So I'm going to call this the universal framework. Now, how do you evaluate policies? One way is theoretically. I can, I can say, oh, I can prove that this is optimal, or here are regret bounds. Or I can say asymptotically, here's an algorithm that will asymptotically give me the optimal, provably optimal policy. Maybe I'm running numerical simulations, either on a laptop or, or in the cloud. And sometimes I have to run these policy evaluations in the field. Now, let's take a look at machine learning. In machine learning, I'm looking for functions that we call statistical models. And I want to find the best model to say, predict demand as a function of price. And maybe somebody comes in and says, I think this is a linear function. And if so, I want to find the best linear function. Now, somebody else may come in and go, oh, no, 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 it's got to be a nonlinear function like this. Well, if that's the case, I want to find the best nonlinear function. Somebody else is going to insist I've got to do a neural network. I'm going to say, be careful. Uh, there's a risk of, of, of overfitting this. But the core idea is that I'm picking some function from this family of lookup tables, parametric models, and non-parametric models. I want to find the best function. And to do that, I need this thing called the big data set. Now, it's not always big. Sometimes I have small data sets. Now, let's compare machine learning to sequential decisions. In machine learning, I'm looking for functions, statistical models. In sequential decisions, I'm looking for functions that we call policies. In machine learning, I need a data set for training the function. Sequential decisions, I do not need a training data set. I need a model that models the physical problem. I need a contribution function. I need that transition function. So let's pause at this point and say, how do we search over policies? So we're going to talk now about designing policies. Now, I get a lot of questions of what's a policy. A policy is a method that maps a state variable into a decision, any method. So policies in the English language, policies come up in all kinds of ways. Here's 45 different terms that all mean policy. These are all English words for saying this is what to do in a certain situation. And if you'd like to go to tinyurl.com slash policies and decisions, and maybe you can add one that I haven't thought of. It turns out there are two fundamental ways of building a policy. One is to take a class, a function, uh, and I can look over classes of functions, and I can look within a class to find the function that simply works best over time, on average. And then I have look ahead approximations where I'm going to say, you know what, I'm going to take the cost or contribution to making decision now, plus the downstream impact. Usually I have to approximate that, and I want to optimize across the sum of the, the first period contribution plus future contributions. And if I do the best I can now, that'll be the best decision. And that's a policy. Now, each of these can be divided into two subclasses. So I'm going to now walk through these four classes of policies. So we'll start with policy search. The simplest of these are what I call policy function approximations. These are simple rules like order up to uh, inventory policies. Inventory goes below theta min, you order up to theta max. Uh, you can buy when the price goes below theta min, sell when it goes above theta max, a buy low, sell high policy. Basically, a PFA is any lookup table, linear, nonlinear model, neural network, non-parametric model, any analytic function. Now, a second class is I call them cost function approximations. This is when I parameterize an, an optimization problem. Now, these are approximate optimization problems. Finding the shortest path to a destination, I'm going to use a deterministic look ahead. I'm going to take my best point estimate of the travel times. And maybe I trust the path that Google Maps comes up with. But when it says that I need 40 minutes to arrive, I have another decision. When do I depart on the trip? And I might look at that 40 minutes and go, oh, I'm not sure about that. I'm going to add 15 minutes. That's a tunable parameter. Uh, the power uh, companies will plan their energy generation for tomorrow, but they have uncertainty in what the wind and solar is doing, or maybe a generator might fail. So they're going to add uh, uh, reserves in case of a generator failure. And by the way, there's a nice policy when I'm advertising products and I have an estimated revenue if I put product X up, but I have uncertainty in that estimate. And let's say I have a standard deviation. Turns out what really works best is a formula called upper confidence bounding, where you take the estimated revenue plus theta times the standard deviation. 
In each case, I have a tunable parameter theta that I have to tune. Um, parametric CFAs, by the way, are widely used in industry in an ad hoc way, often, not always, but often without the tuning. Turns out it's actually quite a powerful strategy. Now let's go to look ahead approximations. So let's say I just decide PFAs aren't working for me, usually because my problem's too complicated. So we get into this equation. So this is a little bit frightening, um, but this is our core equation that we have to work with. We have the contribution we receive now for making a decision, and then we have this downstream impact. And that's a little complicated, so we're gonna talk this through. The biggest challenge is how, to, how do you compute this? So let me just talk you through this a little bit using a decision tree. We're gonna start off that square note is I'm in a state, this is where I am now, and I have, okay, my three decisions, and I wanna find the best of these, then if something's random is gonna happen, I'm gonna to have to take the expectation over those. Then I have the whole rest. Now, the first element of that is optimizing over policy. The policy is the decision I make, not in one box, but in every box. So I have to have a rule for making what decision I make, no matter what state I land in. So that's a function. So I have to be searching over the functions. And then I have an expectation over all the random stuff in the future. So not surprisingly, that sounds hard. One strategy is to take, say, a piece of that. Let's take this piece and say, let's reduce that down to a function called a value function. That's the value being in this state, st plus one. There's the whole field of research called Markov decision processes. By the way, also optimal control is an entire community that depends on this called Bellman's equation or Hamilton Jacobi equations. It turns out there are problems where I can compute this exactly, but not very many. So one strategy is to say, well, let's do an approximation using machine learning. So this has been broadly called approximate dynamic programming, adaptive dynamic programming. Um, I still had this expectation that can be very uh, uh, difficult to deal with inside a maximization problem. I can get rid of that by using a post-decision state, something I did in my ADP book. Now I have a deterministic optimization problem. This opens the door to X being a vector. There's whole communities out there where they don't allow X to be a vector. Um, now, if you wrap everything together into one giant function, and now let's use the letter Q, uh, computer scientists call this Q learning. Uh, we have to use Q because they call the field Q learning, uh, and it's by now very well known. Now, let's just a uh, little illustration of what this allows us to do. Let's take a, a fleet management problem where I'm assigning drivers to loads and I, I may have hundreds or thousands of drivers. And I have to do this over time. And what happens in the future is uncertain. So talk about having a vector value decision with uncertainty in the future. This is a very complicated problem. It turns out with approximate dynamic programming, that first contribution is the cost of assigning drivers to loads. The downstream value, if I use the right approximation, I end up with a simple linear program and I can uh, solve this problem for very, very large fleets. So in very special cases, this is not a panacea, but in very special cases, I can solve very big problems, but I can't solve everything. So one of the strategies, the last, the fourth of the four classes of policies is what I call a direct look ahead. So the direct look ahead, I already argued, I, I can't solve that whole look ahead with all the uncertainties and the maximization of policies. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do an approximate look ahead model. We're gonna simplify our model for the purpose of looking ahead. And I'm gonna use the same notation of states, decisions, and information, but I'm gonna put tildes on the top. And I'm gonna put a double time index. The first T is when I'm making the decision. And the second index T prime is T prime in when I'm peeking into the future. Now there's a lot of approximations that I can introduce to make this approximate model. I can do a sampled information process. I can do simplified policies. I can restrict the horizon. I can use a, a reduced state variable. I can pull some variables out and just ignore them. And if I need to, I can simplify decisions or maybe simplify the rules for making decisions. So let's assume that I can create this approximate look ahead. And now I'm gonna peek into the future with a problem that now I'm gonna pretend I can solve and I'm gonna use this to make a decision now. Then I'm gonna roll forward, approximate the future, use this to make a decision now, do this over and over again. This is a, look at, a direct look ahead policy where I'm planning into the future. Here's a popular instance of it, Google Maps. So here's a problem. I was up in Hartford, Connecticut, working with a company, Pratt & Whitney. I'll get back to them. Uh, I was helping them with a supply chain problem. 
And I'm four o'clock in the afternoon and Google Maps is saying to get back home to my uh, uh, home in Princeton, New Jersey. Oh, the best path goes right through New York. And I'm like, oh, Google, no, New York. I'm there at five o'clock. That's just not gonna work for me. So Google has an alternate path, five minutes longer, goes completely around New York City, much better. In effect, I'm, I, what I'm doing to solve my problem is I'm modifying my objective. There are entire fields of research, like a deterministic look head is widely known as model predictive control. Actually, all the dynamic, uh, direct look aheads are, are model predictive control, but this is most often associated with deterministic look aheads. I can do robust optimization, stochastic programming. I can even do approximate dynamic programming, all as a form of, 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 of approximate look ahead. So these are very powerful strategies. Now, I just reviewed the four classes of policies. We have our two core strategies, the policy search policies, the PFAs and the CFAs, and the look ahead policies, the VFAs and the VLAs. Now I'm gonna claim that these four classes cover everything. Any possible way that you come up with to make a decision will fall in one of these four classes of policies and possibly a hybrid. So at this point, I'm gonna claim I have a universal formulation for sequential decision problems and a general roadmap. This doesn't mean that I've solved all of your problems. These are meta classes and you still have a lot of work to do, but it's a guideline and it overcomes the limitation of many people, including me for most of my life, of saying, oh, approximate dynamic programming, I can solve all problems with ADP. Trust me, you can't. So if you go to jungle.princeton.edu, scroll down until you see this picture, please print it out, pin it to your desk, this is a one page, very streamlined view of the universal framework where I have the objective function and then I have the four classes of policies. And anytime you find yourself making a decision, you're using one of these four classes, maybe a hybrid. Now, it turns out if you go to the academic community, most of the literature is in the look ahead classes, the, the policies based on Bellman's equation or Hamilton Jacoby, approximate dynamic programming or the look ahead policies. Most real world decisions are made with the policy search class because they're simpler. Uh, and so this is what you're gonna most likely see in practice. But as I've learned to tell my students, the price of simplicity is tun tunable parameters and tuning is hard. By the way, sometimes coming up with the, the parametric policy is hard too. So there are times when, yes, you're gonna have to go to the look ahead class. Google Maps is an example. Here's a little illustration of an energy problem. I can get energy from my wind farm or the grid. Uh, the wind farm has varying amounts of energy. So the supply of energy is, is, is stochastic. Uh, grid, I can always get any amount of energy from the grid uh, for practical purposes, but the price that I have to pay uh, can be very random. And I have to serve my load in this building. Uh, and I have a Tesla mega pack for my energy storage. Now, what I did was I took this problem and I created five variations of this problem. And I was working with Stefan Meisel, uh, who did all the numerical work here. There's five variations where I tweaked and tuned, I made things more or less random, maybe it's stationary, maybe less so. Then I created five different policies, the first four of which are each of the four classes, and the fifth one is a hybrid. And the number in the cell is, this is how well I did relative to what I could have done with perfect information. And you can see I've made each of the five classes work best. And I claim on, a, on, on the same broad problem class, I just tweaked the data a little bit. So I'm gonna claim you really do need to know all four classes of policies. So let's go back to our comparison machine learning and sequential decisions. Um, first thing that we found is uh, of our four classes of policies, the first class, the PFAs, is every possible function that you might use in machine learning. It's the whole universe of problems from machine learning. I still have three more classes to go. Cost function approximations, value function approximations, and direct look aheads, each of which is itself an optimization problem. So here is my broader class for making decisions uh, that I claim is now our general roadmap. So I have an introductory book, it's on the internet. Go to tinyurl.com, sequential decision analytics. It's uh, written in Overleaf. Uh, with the exception of three chapters, every chapter is an application. It uses a teach by example style. It demonstrates how to model sequential decision problems. Every application chapter uses the exact same modeling style. And I've chosen the problem to illustrate all four classes of policies. And it also highlights uh, the role of uncertainty modeling, which is very important. It's, it's right in there with designing the policy. 
Now, I'm working on this uh, much more advanced book. It's a graduate level book, uh, but I taught it at Princeton. I got students from a number of different departments, so it's not just for the heavy math crowd. Um, and this should be coming out in 2022 uh, by Wiley. I'm hard at work on this, but if you go to castlab.princeton.edu slash RLSO, uh, you can download the, current, the, the latest version. I'm working on it as we speak. So now let's illustrate this for real world problems. So I'm, I'm the chief analytics officer for Optimal Dynamics. If you go to tinyurl.com decision analytics and trucking, you can download a technical white paper. Uh, this has has some math, it's about 13 to 14 pages, uh, but it's skimmable and it shows us the work that we do with the truckload industry uh, using all four classes of policies. And so this is the foundation of the analytic framework at Optimal Dynamics. Uh, for example, and I'm gonna give you a brief tour. Here, we start with our truckload trucking problem, but now I'm gonna to go to this picture where I have my drivers and loads. That's just for time period T. So that uh, blue rectangle is a bunch of drivers and loads at time T, but I have downstream, I have the value of drivers in the future. Now that blue problem is a fairly easy problem to solve and I can simulate into the future, simulating random events. And I can do this over and over again. And while I'm doing that, I'm learning the value functions. Now here is actual numbers from Optimal Dynamics where we ran this on 11 different carriers. Uh, uh, iteration one is no value functions and this is a, a, a basic myopic policy. Uh, you can still purchase these optimization models commercially with no downstream value. And you can see the effect of learning, we get it from anywhere from a 15 to you know, over a 40% improvement through the optimizing of the VFAs. Now let's take a look at these two problems. So on the left, we've got uh, our game of Go. Uh, one of the great breakthroughs of this field called reinforcement learning is plain Go. On the right is a trucking company with 5,000 trucks. And every truck has a truck driver, the truck driver to describe by a 15 dimensional vector of attributes, giving hours of service and home domicile and equipment type. And is he a US citizen or Canadian or Mexican? Um, and we are, can do the dynamics of this. We're optimizing across all 5,000 drivers, not just here and now, but thinking about which are the best loads in the future and, and how do I get my driver home? So this is a very hard, complex industrial strength problem. And here's one of the problems that we had to solve. Today's Monday, shipper calls in, but a load of freight has to be moved on Friday, but I have to say yes or no now. So I have to accept or reject the load. I don't even know where my drivers are gonna be on Friday. So this is where I have to plan into the future. And I have to say, will I even have a driver? If I have a driver, is this even a load that I want? Does it help get the driver home? Is it profitable enough? So it turns out we're back into, I did a slight variation of this equation where now what we have is we have a look ahead policy where I have to both dispatch trucks in the future where I use my VFAs, but I still have to do load acceptance in the future. So even though today's Monday and maybe I have a load with a certain revenue, possibly a load will be called in on Tuesday to be moved on Thursday or Friday, maybe at even higher revenue. And I have to think about that. Now I'm gonna run this approximate policy. Now this row, I got rid of my expectation because I'm gonna use a risk metric because I wanna look at the probability that I might not be able to cover the load. Um, now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run 20 parallel simulations into the future. And let's say for my particular load I'm looking at, uh, 18 out of 20 times I cover the load. So I have a 90% probability of acceptance. Uh, now I can run this policy, I can simulate this policy into the future tuning these various parameters. Now here's an actual uh, example where we ran this on a, on a large carrier. Uh, what we're trying to do is to blend the carrier's loads with uh, loads from their brokerage division. Now they had gave us about 15,000 loads from their brokerage division. And we sort of picked and, and chose from among those loads. Now of those 5,000 simply didn't work and 3,000 look like home runs. Just every time we simulated forward, we're like, yeah, we like it, we like it. Then there were 10,000 loads in between where there was some probability that we might like it. Maybe we pick a number, 0.8, and we're gonna take every load with a probability over 0.8. Of course, if I do say that I like the load, I'm gonna put a bonus on it. So that maybe that probability will be even higher. We've tested this load acceptance logic on about 10 different carriers with millions of dollars in improvements. Now that carrier A is a very small carrier with 60 or 70 trucks. 
Then we have some bigger carriers. We're getting 20 million, $25 million in, 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 in profit improvements. This is huge. And this is real numbers on real companies uh, uh, with work being done by, by optimal dynamics. Now we can go to even more complex problems. So let's take a supply chain problem. I mentioned that I was up in Hartford working with Pratt and Whitney on their supply chain problem. Now supply chains are big and complicated. Uh, by the way, they make jet engines. These are the Pratt and Whitney jet engines. Uh, and there's, I don't know, a thousand components of very complex parts that have to be made. Now supply chains are really complicated. I mean, you've got stuff going all over the world. How do you optimize this? In the 1990s, somebody actually tried to optimize this as a big uh, uh, linear program. Uh, but these things are just big and messy with a lot of uncertainties. So one way to do it is to first start off by saying, it's not one decision maker. You know, it's not one person optimizing everything. You've got vendors all over the place. Let's model it as a multi-agent system. Let's model each agent as their own policy. So let's reach into my toolbox of policies and model each one of these independently. So let's say there I am making my decision, but I've got upstream agents making decisions that impact me and my decisions impact downstream agents. So what I can do, and each one of these problems is fairly small. So it's actually not that hard to optimize, uh, but I'm optimizing in a realistic way uh, because I'm, I'm looking at an actual decision maker making a decision. So that simulation worked very well, but here's a problem where we use that idea in the field, Norfolk Southern Railroad. Now Norfolk Southern Railroad is a big Eastern railroad in the United States, run about 2000 locomotives, very complicated operations. You can need two to as many five locomotives for every train. The locomotives are all different. Some of them have to get back to shop, just like drivers getting home. So what we did was we broke this up into problems. We divided it over time. These are four hour time increments. We divided it into the rail yards because actually the decisions are made at each rail yard. They put locomotives, those are those rectangles on the left, assigned into trains, the, the rectangles on the right. Now, as you make decisions, if I make a decision in one yard, it has a downstream impact. So what we do is we use value functions, we do feedback learning uh, and do iterations, forward and backward passes. And through this, we learn the value functions and this was hugely successful. It took a long time to get this working, but it's running and in progress. Uh, this was a, an award-winning paper and academic awards are nice, but the real award here is this has been implemented in 2006 and it's still running. And if you want to call up Clark Cheng, uh, 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 he's still there uh, maintaining the system. They use it for strategic planning and tactical, and they use it for shop routing, which I'll call an execution level decision. Now let's also take a look at a real world inventory problem. Um, here we have a inventory uh, a warehouse over there in, in Atlanta, and I have to plan the inventory. So uh, the classical approach is to do some sort of uh, order up to policy when the inventory gets below something, order up to something. Now, the hard part here is where do you put in the fact that somebody says, oh, but I got a cargo ship that's gonna arrive in LA in a few weeks. Oh, and there's a, a car load coming in by, by train. How does this information affect things? Uh, by the way, I, can, I, I might have three cargo ships coming in, one arriving in four days, one in two weeks, and one in the three and a half weeks. How does that change my decision now? Oh, somebody's telling me that I have a hurricane coming in or a storm, or maybe there might be a storm coming in hitting LA uh, and it's gonna delay those ships. Well, one thing that I can do, I mean, what, what does this do to that order up to? Uh, well, one thing that I could do is put it on, on air freight and, and fly it in as, as an emergency measure, or maybe if it's not quite uh, so urgent, I can reroute the ship, uh, send it up to Vancouver and then put it on the train and maybe the train's too slow, I'll put it on trucks. So what we've got is a complex state information about inbound inventory. I've got uncertainties like a storm coming in. I've got responses like rerouting the ship, putting it on air cargo, uh, uh, converting from rail to truck. Now, how do you put all that into an SS inventory problem? I have to look into the future and I need not a simple PFA, I need a look ahead strategy. So uh, the one strategy uh, that has been suggested in the literature is that you can make your uh, order up to uh, uh, parameters, I'm using theta min and theta max, a function of your state variable. Now that's a complex function. It's not obvious what that function looks like. This is a classic case of I'd like a simple rule, but the simple rule isn't so simple now. Now it's actually a kind of a complex function that I have to estimate from data. 
Um, so one way to go is this big, messy, complicated function. Honestly, this is really like Google Maps with uncertainty uh, and with decisions in the future un under uncertainty. But at least I know how to build this. And how do you design the policy? Off the top of my head, I don't know. But I have a roadmap, the four classes of policies. And I'll look at all four. And I have more than one decision. And maybe I'll use different types of policies for different decisions. So when you're working on these problems, you have to sit and think about all four classes of policies. And there's a trade-off. The simpler the policy, uh, the harder it is to design. So now an order up to policy seems simple, but making it state dependent isn't simple. Now a stochastic look ahead, I know how to build it. I know how to build the stochastics. It's just, it's coding, but then computing it is computationally harder. So I know how to build it. I don't have to sort of sit back and go, oh my gosh, how do I build that policy? I know how to do it, but computing is gonna be harder. So now what we've got is a spectrum. And of course that spectrum will bleed. Um, and the look ahead classes tend to be uh, more natural to, 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 to design, harder to compute and the policy search classes or can be harder to design, generally are much easier to compute. So I'm gonna close this by, by making the pitch for a new academic field. So far, I've been talking about three core disciplines of decision analytics optimization, machine learning, and simulation. Each of these are established fields, lots of books, well-defined communities, standard notation, software, available software. But once I go to the world of sequential decisions, I'm into this jungle of stochastic optimization where we just don't have standard notation. We don't have standard tools. We have very little in the way of, of standard toolboxes. And when we do, they tend to be for fairly narrow problems. So uh, there will be 15 different communities, each community with different tools. If you're gonna go uh, work on real applications, let's call it an inventory problem, you're gonna need the whole toolbox. You need all of those tools to, in order to pick out the best approach for your problem. I'm gonna uh, suggest, hope, that my two books are a starting point. Uh, these are books that are not married to a particular tool. These are not a hammer looking for a nail. They're broad based like all the other analytics books. You go to a book in optimization machine learning, you get broad based books that cover you know, a broad set of tools. And when you've gone through those courses, you come out with, with good training. Uh, I think that these books offer the same thing. And right now they're all available for free. The, this, the, the online book is a good starting point because it uses a teach by example style. And uh, uh, up until say sometime late summer, you can still get the reinforcement learning book off my website but I submit it to Wiley in September and by around then I'm gonna probably pull it off. So my academic proposal is I claim we need academic programs and these can be academic programs aimed at a more methodological audience an engineering audience or more application oriented. I think the home, good home community is probably industrial engineering. Uh, you need students with some analytic skills uh, but not advanced analytic skills. But you can also teach at least some of the simple classes of policies to people who are much more domain oriented, that, that want to see this in the context of a particular application. If you go to castlelab.princeton.edu forward slash SDA, uh, that's for sequential decision analytics. That's where I pitch uh, uh, my call for a new field. Now, all of this, by the way, is available at jungle.princeton.edu. Um, I think it's a good starting point. I appreciate it. Would love some comments. Thank you very much.